right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in to this science short with Mr. Perkins. Uh, everybody's under a lot of stress with being quarantined, having schools shut down, and the least I felt I could do is use some of my own science and biology background to provide a little bit of relief for that. Um, and so, uh, you can't see me right now, but I promise in keeping with good science teacher tradition, I'm currently wearing a tie with a strand of DNA on it to establish my science teacher creds. So, all right, uh, I'm going to start the way I started all of my classes when I taught high school. Uh, we start with birthdays. Uh, it is March 23rd. It is the birthday of Werner von Braun, uh, born March 23rd, 1912. He was certainly a complicated historical figure, but one of the fathers of modern rocketry and one of the designers of the Saturn V rocket that helped us with the Apollo program uh, be first on the moon. It is also the birthday of the passenger elevator. The very first passenger elevator was installed March 23rd, 1857 by the Otis Elevator Company. Uh, and if you look at elevators to this day, frequently you will see the name Otis on them. So happy birthday to Werner von Braun and elevators. So last week when I announced I was going to do these videos, I asked if anybody had any questions and we got a great one right off the bat. Uh, Tesla, age 10, asks... How do fish breathe underwater? Uh, the short answer is gills. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. I appreciate that. Uh, but of course, we do owe Tesla more details than that. Uh, here we've got a couple examples of gills on the screen. We've got uh, this shark here, the standard slitted gills on the side. We've got the bottom of a stingray here. And we can see its gills on the underside of it. Uh, here's your standard uh, pet goldfish. It's got its gills there. And then these lines here on the shrimp are its gills. So we're talking about how do fish breathe underwater. Uh, and so the things we're gonna cover, we're gonna cover gills, we're gonna cover what respiration is, what does it mean to breathe, and we're gonna cover uh, diffusion. And then some vocab terms we're gonna to use today, we're gonna to talk about gas exchange, we're gonna talk about analogous structures, and we're gonna use aerobic and anaerobic. Uh, I have a particular Love of bad jokes, so here, please enjoy these two schools of fish that you see to go along with today's lecture on breathing. So, what are we talking about with gas exchange? Gas exchange is very simply, things that are alive need something from the air. When we're talking about mammals, us as humans, or fish, that gas exchange, we are taking carbon dioxide, we use that, that's from our bodies and exchanging that with oxygen in the air. That's gas exchange. And because we use oxygen, we are aerobic creatures as opposed to some things that don't use oxygen at all, or in fact, oxygen is a poison, are anaerobic creatures. Uh, I always remember the difference because if you think of if you're doing exercise, if you're doing aerobics, that's something you're breathing a lot. So aerobic, you need oxygen. That's the gas we're taking in. Carbon dioxide is the gas we're giving off. And there are a bunch of different ways different animals do that. Uh, here we see external gills. If you think of the feathery uh, things on the neck we see on salamanders or newts, those are external gills. Today we're going to be talking a lot about internal gills. Uh, as mammals, we have lungs. Uh, and then there are insects, which I'm not going to go into too much today. I just want to reassure everybody that the way insects do gas exchange is what keeps insects so small. So if you're somebody who's afraid of the idea of uh, giant horror movie spiders, I can assure you that giant sized insects can't actually exist because they can't get oxygen. So if you take nothing else from today's quick 10 minute thing, uh, be reassured, giant insects, they just don't exist. Uh, so when we're talking about all of these, these things all do the same thing. They all do gas exchange, external gills and lungs. They look different and they function a little different, but the ultimate purpose is the same. So that's what we call an analogous structure. External gills, internal gills, lungs, they all do roughly the same thing, but with some differences. So those are analogous structures. If you also think of like our foot versus a dog's paw, versus a cow's hoof. They're all similar, they're analogous, and they do roughly the same thing, but they're not quite identical. So those are analogous structures. So we're focusing on internal gills today. 
inhaling and exhaling, that respiration. Just like us, when a fish breathes in, breathes in through the mouth, but when it breathes out, it breathes out through its gills. It's forcing that water that it's breathed in through its gills. And by doing that, by breathing in oxygen-rich water and forcing that oxygen-rich water over its gills, it can take the oxygen that's in the water and bring it into its bloodstream, just like we do with oxygen out of the air into our lungs. Here you can see the, wa the water comes in through the mouth and then out between the gills. And we can see the water comes through here. These are all the blood vessels in the fish's gills, just like we have millions and millions of blood vessels in our lungs. They have all the blood vessels in their gills. And what's happening here is the blood flow is in the opposite direction of the water. This is called countercurrent exchange, countercurrent flow, and increases the ability of the oxygen to transmit through the membrane into the blood. So that's how fish are breathing underwater in a nutshell. They're able to absorb the oxygen that's in the water through their gills into their bloodstream just the same way we do it with our lungs. Um, and then here's a little close-up of, of those gills, and you can really see how individually fine and almost feathery these gills are uh, that allow for this gas exchange to happen. Uh, and so when we talk about oxygen, fish use oxygen just like we use oxygen, uh, and water holds oxygen just like air does, although water holds it at slightly differing amounts, and we can see by this chart here, we can see if oxygen is measured at one, two, or three parts per million, fish is going to have a really hard time with that. Fish isn't going to be able to breathe, just like if there wasn't oxygen in the air for us. But when we get up here, when there's more oxygen in the water, fish are able to do better. And this is a little dependent on the species. If we think of a fish like a brown trout, they're actually able to survive with much less dissolved oxygen than other types of fish are that need more abundant oxygen. When we're talking about oxygen in the air, we're right about here. Most air is just below nine parts per million of dissolved oxygen. Uh, if you've got friends or parents who have a fish tank, they're probably used to measuring dissolved oxygen in their fish tank. That makes certain that the fish have enough oxygen to breathe and that it's comfortable for them. I want to talk about diffusion. When I say that the air is pulled, or sorry, when I talk about the oxygen pulled out of the water through the gills into the bloodstream, how does that happen? Uh, and the process is diffusion. If we think, if we look right here, if we've got a tube with gas and a tube that's a vacuum, and if we open this uh, valve between the two of them, the air is going to balance itself out. The gas is going to spread itself evenly along the whole chamber. And this is true if you've got mixtures as well. So here if we've got just hydrogen gas, and here if we've got just oxygen gas, if we open this valve, the two are going to come to an equilibrium. The two are going to balance each other out. So when we've got the water having a high amount of oxygen, and we've got the fish's blood having a low amount of oxygen, that oxygen will naturally try to balance itself out. It will try to be even across the whole area and that's going to push the oxygen into the bloodstream. So that means that, that that membrane in both the fish's gills and in our lungs is very thin to allow that transfer of the oxygen. Uh, if you can picture a centimeter and then if you can picture chopping that centimeter up into 100 pieces and if you take one of those 100 pieces and you chop that up into 100 pieces, you take one of those, one ten thousandth of a centimeter, that's the thickness of the membrane between the water and the fish's bloodstream through the gill, and that's pretty much the same in us. That one ten thousandth of a centimeter is the thickness between the oxygen, the air that we breathe in and the blood vessels in our lungs, and that allows, that very thin layer allows the oxygen to balance out across the whole area and allows us then uh, both humans to breathe air and then fish to breathe water and that to breathe the oxygen out of the water and that's respiration. So thank you everyone. Uh, I hope we were able to answer Tesla's question of how fishes breathe and I hope we also learned a little bit more about uh, respiration in general. So thank you very much. 
Uh, I am going to be posting another science one of these on Wednesday, so please, if you have questions, send them in. And then on Friday, I'm going to be doing a social studies one about the process of running for office. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please remember to wash your hands, cough into your arm, uh, and remember that we will get through this and things will, uh, things will be normal again. Uh, and I want to end this the same way that I ended all of my classes, uh, and that is with a Perkins puzzler. Uh, so we'll go over the answer to this on when I post my video on Wednesday. But for now, your riddle is, I am wet when I dry, what am I? Thank you very much, and I hope everybody has a great Monday.